Well, that brings me to the third and the final um, part of this lesson in meteorology. And this arguably is, is where you're gonna find more evidence of a scientific objective than any other place, and it's in meteorology. The Bible contains so much on what we call the hydrologic cycle, or we commonly call it the water cycle. The Bible is full of information on this. And matter of fact, when I used to teach middle school for a couple of years, I taught middle school um, and I did physical science and I did earth science. And in my earth science one time, now this was with a Christian school, um, I said, we're gonna do something different this year as we study the hydrologic cycle. I said, I want you to put your books away and get your Bibles out. And I'm gonna teach this system, uh, this, this objective, this, this whole hydrologic cycle, just using verses in the Bible. And they're like, what? I said, it's all in there. Just follow me. And I'm gonna take you through this. This is just absolutely amazing. Now, to begin with, as I get a drink of water, talking about the water cycles made me thirsty. Mm. Ooh, good water. Anyway, by the way, that's well water, so that came out of the earth. Do you know that they used to think, science used to teach that, there, that water under the earth was in, um, an inexhaustible water supply that water was just under the earth and we could never ever get get rid of it it would just always be there but science was also confused about something else they were puzzled scientists were puzzled for the longest time watching snow or rain come down and land on the pavement and then after a little while the sun comes out and starts shining and it seems like the water disappeared I could just imagine somebody walking in class to Oxford back centuries ago and walk in there during a rainstorm and afterwards go out to lunch and the rain has stopped and on the way back there's puddles and stuff all around. Wow, what happened to the water in the puddles? The sun must have dried it up or something or made it disappear. They didn't know. Maybe a student went back and asked a professor, what happened to the rain, the water that was on the, uh, on the, the walkways and stuff because when we left class, there was puddles there. As we came back, there's no puddles. And the answer that science gave, are you ready for this? The answers that science gave was, it just disappears. It just ceases to exist. Really? Uh, that's what science said for centuries. And you would find this taught at universities and things, and it, it, it's sort of crazy. But this system, this, this cycle, in, um, it, it really wouldn't come into play and be understood until the 19th century. Um, because people were puzzled. Where did the water come from? Why did it rain here? Why, why did it rain over there? Why did it rain here? Um, and afterwards, where did the water go? Or the snow on the ground and it melts. Where did it go? It's, and being told by scientists that it just disappears, that it ceases to exist, just didn't make sense to them. Science couldn't figure out where the rain came from or where it went afterwards. Now, as I said, the Bible has clear answers for this, but these are people who weren't looking for the answers in the Bible because, like I said, and I agree, the Bible's not a science textbook, but as I said, if there's science in here coming from a holy God, it's going to be true. Well, Many believe that the earth, like I say, had an inexhaustible subterranean reservoir under the, the earth that stored all the water. How'd they come up with this? Well, you go out, dig a hole in the ground. You make it deep enough, guess what? A lot of places you find water and you get wells. In Israel, you can go to, um, in ancient Israel, they dug wells everywhere. As a matter of fact, when I lead tours to Israel, we go to certain places, Beersheba, um, you go up uh, into some other cities and stuff. You can actually see the ancient wells where they were and stuff. And you can see the water systems that the, the Hebrew people put together, the Israelites, the Jews, and how they did these. You dig down in the earth, you can get water. So that's where they came up with, wow, there's, there's some type of supply down there that just never seems to run out. Hmm. That's very interesting. But what does the Bible have to, day, have to say about that? And, and, and where did these ideas about the hydrologic cycle come from, this water cycle? Well, as I just said, the Israelites started getting an idea of this because they had the Word of God. The Greeks, very knowledgeable people, sort of prided themselves on their knowledge, they pretty much knew how the water cycle worked also. But actually, it wouldn't be until about 2,000 years for science to actually formulate it and prove it. Yeah, 2,000 years. Even though the Israelites figured a lot of this out, they all knew it. They were agriculturally based, they understood it. But the rest of the world, 
didn't quite get it. The Greeks had it to a degree, but the Israelites really understood it because of the word of God. But science sometimes takes a long time to come around and finally admit, you know, some, this was all in the Bible. We should have just believed that. Now, let me take you through this. This is really interesting how this was done. I've already told you what, the, what science was teaching, which is a little bizarre. But one of the first scientists to formulate the modern hydrologic or water cycle was a guy by the name of Bernard Palissy. Now, this guy is really interesting. You, you got to really search to try and find information on him. But he was a very strong Bible-believing Protestant who lived during the time of the Reformation. And during this time, um, he was actually persecuted for his belief. He was a Protestant. And um, a lot of the Roman Catholics at that time in Europe were really upset with him. And they put him in jail and they tortured him and stuff um, because of his biblical beliefs. But he came up and in some of his writings, it shows that he came up and theorized about the hydrologic cycle. Thing is, he never did experiments to prove it because, well, they stuck him in jail. Uh, so he couldn't have access to stuff. But from the little writings and stuff that exist from what he did put down, it does seem that he had an understanding of this. And again, he was a person who studied the word of God. And so I can't help but wonder if this is where he picked up a lot of this. Now, the next person to come along to help us with this theory was none other than Leonardo da Vinci, uh, who we already mentioned once before in this lesson. He lived at the same time as Palissy, but, um, and, and as we said already, da Vinci was a Bible believer. He also came up with ideas about the hydrologic cycle or the water cycle. And he did jot down a few conclusions on it that seemed to be based from a biblical perspective uh, because it sort of parallels this. But we don't know because he didn't spend any, exper any time experimenting on it or spending a lot of time studying it. Um, he was busy doing other things and painting and stuff and, and other type of scientific endeavors as he was working on it. But about the same time, um, a man named um, Pierre per Perrault, actually about 100 years after da Vinci, um, Pierre Perrault, he lived in Paris. You can get by that name. Wow. Yes, he's from Paris. And uh, this Frenchman was an amazing guy because he studied the Seine River that flowed through Paris. And he started noticing that it would rain in the countryside into streams. The water would flow into the streams and into creeks and stuff and into other rivers, which would then dump into the main river there. And so he started doing quantitative studies of how much water was coming down in the countryside and how much water was flowing through the city of Paris. And he came up with the idea that the, that the river there in Paris is being fed by all the rainwater and the melting snow and that's what was doing it and he came up with a really good idea of this water cycle he's often credited uh, with the discovery of the water cycle because he actually performed experiments testing his idea there and he wrote a book called on the origin of springs what a title Sounds like something from the 1960s in the United States. But anyway, it, he wrote this book and he described what he was studying. So he's sometimes called the father or the discoverer of the water cycle. But there was another person who comes along, William Prout. William Prout, I, I really like this guy. This guy is fascinating. Um, he's a theologian. Um, He's a naturalist also. He's, he's a guy who studied, uh, he was a scientist. He studied biology frequently and, and he had a knowledge of working chemistry and meteorology and, and, and uh, human anatomy. He had, the guy was brilliant. And he lived in the 1700s to the mid 1800s. And he did a lot of studying. And as I said, this guy's a theologian. He studies the Bible carefully. This is a scientist who dissected scripture. He studied scripture carefully. And so he wrote a book called Chemistry, Meteorology, and the Function of Digestion, considered with references to natural theology. We don't make titles of books like that anymore. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, but he wrote all of this, and much of his conclusions on the water cycle came from the Bible. Isn't that cool? I bet you didn't know all this stuff, that these guys, these scientists that are working on this are getting a lot of their information right out of the Bible, where scientists today are trying to say, and not just, you know, a few scientists are saying, don't trust the Bible. The Bible is full of science errors. Well, really? Look how much science is being proved by the Bible here. So what does the Bible contain concerning this scientific fact about all this? Let me show you now what the Bible says. What were these people finding? What was Prout finding and, and stuff as, as they were studying scripture to find out about how the water cycle works? 
work. Well, let's take a real quick journey here through Scripture. Back around, let's go back to about 700 B.C. That's a good time. The prophet Isaiah, in his book, um, chapter 55, verse 10, and I'm going to read this out of the New American Standard Version. It's a word-for-word translation to make sure we get this really clear. It says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth, making it bring forth and sprout. Oh, my gosh. That's the water cycle in one verse. Rain and snow, precipitation coming down from where? From the heavens, from the sky, comes down. It comes down to the earth. It's going to make things grow. It's going to make things sprout, et cetera, et cetera. And then what's it do? It says it returns back up into the sky. This is the water cycle in one verse. Isn't it amazing? 700 B.C. But as I told you, the Israelites were figuring out a lot of this stuff. Now, there's another one. Let's go back a little bit further in time. Let's go to King Solomon. Uh, 950 B.C. In the book Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, it says, All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. You see what puzzled people, not just uh, scientists, but it puzzled a lot of people who lived near the ocean, lived near estuaries where rivers and streams would feed into the ocean. You see all this water going into the ocean day after day after day and night after night, but the thing is the shoreline never keeps going up. The ocean stays stable. The water level pretty much is stable. It puzzled people. How can you have all this water from these rivers flowing into the ocean and the ocean is not full? That's what this is talking about. And this gets into the water cycle because we know now that it, uh, the water, just like we saw in the last verse, evaporates, goes back up. It's right there. Uh, let's go to an older book. Let's go to the book of Job. As I said, oldest book in the Bible. We don't know exactly when Job lived, but many theologians believe that he probably lived some, well, somewhere after Noah, but before Abraham. So maybe uh, 2000 BC, 4000 BC. We're not exactly sure. But he writes about the water cycle. The oldest book in the Bible has the water cycle in it. It's Job chapter 36, verses 27 and 28. Listen to this and hold on to your seats because this is absolutely scientific. For he draws up the drops of water. They distill his mist in rain, which the skies pour down and drop on mankind abundantly. Did you catch that? Did you see the word distill even in here? That's a science term. Distill. That's changing water, liquid water, to a vapor. And it's like, it's in the Bible. I mean, does it get any cooler than that? I love this verse. Look at this. Drops of water are being drawn up. Water vapor, air, uh, going up into the air. It turns into what? It turns into rain. Which then what happens? The skies pour the rain, the water back down on the earth abundantly. This is the water cycle right here. I mean, does it get any clearer than this? And people try and tell me, well, the Bible's full of science errors. Explain that one. Because science books had this wrong for so long, yet the Bible's got it correct. Or Look at the... We're not done. Look what else Job has. In chapter 26, verse 8, it says, He binds up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not split open under them. This tells us what clouds were made of. You know that science was puzzled by that for the longest time, too? What exactly are those clouds up there? Why do they look like that? Why do they change colors? It's water, water vapor, and we all know that today. Everybody learns this today. It's right in the Bible, in the oldest book of the Bible, in fact. Oh, let's go back uh, to King David. King David uh, lived around 1000 BC. In Psalm, he writes this beautiful song, Psalm 135, in verse 7, it says this. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings, for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Whoa. You know what this is saying? Where is the water kept? In storehouses. There are storehouses. What's the storehouse? Well, he goes on with this. In verse uh, chapter 33, verse 7, he gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, and he puts the deeps in storehouses. Here, the Bible is telling us what we know today is scientific fact, bodies of water, like the sea, um, that is the storehouse for the water. 
and that's where it goes. The sun shines on it, turns it in, and distills it to vapor. It goes up. There you go. Or as Nemo says, all, all streams run to the ocean. That's because it's the storehouse of everything. There it is right in the Bible, too. The sea is the storehouse. Oh, we're, you know, we're not done yet? No. How about this one? The prophet Amos. Amos lived around 750 B.C. He, too, writing under the influence of the Holy Spirit, he writes this in Amos chapter 5, verse 8. Who calls for the waters of the sea? There again, we have this whole point. Uh, the sea is the storehouse. But who calls the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth? Here again, you got the water cycle described. Waters of the sea being poured out onto the surface of the earth. <sighs> You see that the water cycle, the hydrologic cycle, is scientifically covered. This science is so accurately covered in the Bible. I have taught classes on meteorology having to do with the water cycle, totally using the Bible, and then let the students go take the standardized testing and stuff, and they get this because the Bible has this so accurately, and in so many verses, in so many time frames by so many different authors, it's absolutely amazing. And the thing is, they all, like, what I love about the Word of God, it actually all builds upon each other. It's not contradictions. And we see this is all truth. The truth that the Bible is scientifically accurate. How does it get any better than that? Well, we're out of time in this lesson, and I hope you've enjoyed this. I've enjoyed having you with, and I hope you'll come back again because we'll be having another lesson uh, following after this one. Um, and I just, I, I just, I'm so excited, and I'm so glad you're joining us. Uh, until you, we meet again on this, uh, this channel, y'all take care. God bless.